to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, verse 10. My brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that others may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Well, as we've been laboring through this text, the text tells us we're at war. Right? And so the worst thing that a soldier of Christ can do is live with this peacetime mentality when this war is still ongoing. We've asked the question before, if you were to chat, you know, poll uh, the majority of Christians in this land, and ask them, what's the greatest threat? Well, what do you think they would answer? What would they say? Oh, that Biden would get into office. Well, notice, Paul says here that your greatest threat is that you have an enemy. It's not flesh and blood. You have a spiritual adversary who wages war on you habitually and always. He's your greatest threat. And it's interesting, go back to Genesis 3. When you read through the scriptures... You see from the very beginning that this warfare was established. Notice what God says to the serpent in Genesis 3. Go back to verse 14. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And notice, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Notice, there's going to be enmity between the seed of the woman and those seed of Satan. And remember, you know, Christ, uh, we talk about the, the, the seed of Satan, is, you know, does he have these physical descendants? Well, it's picturing something here. There's a spiritual, those who father after, uh, follow after their father Satan. And this is exactly what Jesus accused the Pharisees of doing there in John 8. So the seed of the woman is Christ, and those who put their trust in him are going to be at war with Satan. Turn to Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah 1. Look at verse 7. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over nations and over kingdoms. Now notice what he's setting them over to do, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, and to build, and to plant. So notice here, Jeremiah, as the prophet, has been given authority to bring down, destroy those things, those cultures, those things within culture that oppose God. Now let's make sure we understand the nature of this warfare. This warfare is not physical through the raising up of a militia or an army, but through the proclamation of the Word of God. The strategy of, uh, you know, when we think about this warfare that God is calling us to, the war that He's calling uh, Jeremiah to, it's not a strategy of civil disobedience, it's not a strategy of anarchy. Rather, we proclaim the Word of God. Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah to preach what I say. I've given you my word. I put it in your mouth. So say these things and only these things. Jeremiah is given further assurance that God will be with him. God wants Jeremiah to expose, to dismantle the culture in which he lived. God wants him to expose all the false prophets. God wanted Jeremiah to expose an apostate population. He used to do this by the word of God. And then God wants Jeremiah to rebuild that very culture by that same word. Many Christians don't think like this, do they? Just think for a moment. Who made the culture the way it was back in Jeremiah's day? It was the people of God. And that's what's happening within our land. The people who claim to be following Christ or followers of Christ, they don't seem to look like after him. They don't seem to look like him. They don't have their, the same passions he has. 
Their business is not the business of the king. They've not taken on the task of waging war on those that oppose those things that oppose God. And in fact, what's interesting, you see many Christian parents who just put their children in those situations, in those institutions, that actually do oppose God. The church has adopted a strategy of toleration, a strategy of convenience, a strategy of compromise. Rather than engage in a strategy of exposing, as Jeremiah was called to do. Think about it. Many within the church not only refuse to expose, they actually participate, they join in. In fact, the church in most cases is no longer a place where the world can feel convicted over their sin. And just, I hope you write this down, make sure you capture this, because a lot of times you'll forget it. This is not an exhortation to be mean-spirited. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about, does our church, does uh, our homes have the aroma of Christ, that he's magnified, that his rule reigns supremely, and only his rule. So when people walk in here, do they say, well, you know, Christ is exalted. I better be careful about how I conduct myself. They take their walk seriously. When people walk into your home, do they think, well, Christ is exalted here. I better give attention to how I behave myself when I walk into this home. I better think twice about doing something that dishonors the God of the people who live here. Well, you see, what we believe in our heart really shows out within our lives. And this can be manifested in a lot of ways, right? Do you believe that, for example, this is the day of days, right? Do you believe that this is the day the Lord wants us to spend with him? To set aside all those other lawful things, because I hope you understand we're not promoting you can do unlawful things on the other days. This is a day where he desires to be with us. And we could press this in a lot of corners. But the point here is that as the church, we are responsible for what's going on within this culture. The, the, the culture looks a lot like the churches. Unfortunately, many don't want to go through the inconvenience of exposing. Well, you know what? People aren't going to like you when you expose sin. So our children and our grandchildren are going to be raised in an America that's far removed from one that honors God. Unfortunately, all they'll be able to do, unless the church decides to engage in this warfare, all the church can do with their children and grandchildren is say, there used to be a time where God was honored. Unless we're willing to engage in the conflict. But I hope you understand that this culture we live in is an evil culture because of the apostasy of the church. The church has decided to be culturally relevant rather than advance the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God. Do you pray and do you agree with the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Many pray that without thinking about what the actual implications are of Christ's rule and reign coming upon earth. So once the church quit believing the word of God, started caring about what the world thought, started handing everything over to the pagans to run, when the church started to seek its own pleasure and what joy can come from man, culture followed. And so God says to Jeremiah, you know, you've got a war on your hands, son, but I've equipped you. I've equipped you with my word and my presence. And notice here in this text, God doesn't say have a rally. God doesn't say form a militia. What does he say? Bring them my word. Bring them my word. And that's the battle we're fighting. Go over to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. You're familiar with this, but I want to point something out. Matthew 16, look at verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said. Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah... Others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, nor for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now notice Jesus is teaching us something here about this warfare, isn't he? And it all starts with this profession of Peter. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus makes it clear. You know, Peter, you didn't just make that up. This has been revealed to you by my Father. 
And it's upon that revelation, it's upon that rock, this confession, this true confession of me, I'm going to build my church. And when I build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now think about what Christ is saying here. He is saying, I will plunder the kingdom of darkness. How will he do this? He's going to plunder the kingdom of darkness by taking people from the kingdom of darkness and bringing them into his own kingdom. Jesus is saying, we should be attacking the gates of hell, not sitting back, not compromising with them. The enemy does not have a chance to succeed from the onslaught of the true church that the true church is going to bring. And this victory brings with it, uh, or this really this victory begins with this confession. You know, we, we studied last night in their celebration of the Reformation. We looked at uh, Latimer, Ridley, and Cranmer. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, when um, Mr. Latimer and Ridley are there and, and the, the, the quote is, play the man... You know, we're gonna we're gonna create a light that that'll never be extinguished. We're all familiar with that quote. But what are they saying? As they look around and see all their enemies standing around them, as the fires are about to be lit and consume them, what are they saying? We got them. We got them exactly where we want them. It's interesting, isn't it? They didn't just sit around back in those days and just pontificate about truth and concepts of truth. They believed the truth. It was so important to them, they were willing to die for it. And so think about that as we consider putting on the belt of truth. It's not an academic exercise, is it? There has to be this desire and this passion uh, for the truth that we are committed to. An ultimate commitment to the truth means we are ultimately committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and His truth. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and to be ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Well, notice the military language here. Paul is teaching back in the first century that they were at war. He makes it clear it's not a fleshly war. But it is a war that includes truth and non-truth. We are using the truth of God to wage war on every false philosophy, every false religion, anything that tries to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. And the key for us is to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that's very similar to what God was telling Jeremiah, right? We are to expose, we are to tear down with the intent to rebuild. Now, these are just a few texts that we can look at to drive home the point that we are at war and the nature of that war. And since we're at war, we need to learn how to fight. And within our text of Ephesians, so turn back over there with me, we are taught to fight. And within our text, we see this metaphor of Christian armor. Since the struggle is not against flesh and blood, the Christian cannot fight it in the power of his own flesh and blood. It's first of all, it's God's battle. And this, can only, this battle can only be fought in God's power and in God's armor. So in Ephesians 6, we see there in verse 14, let's pick up our study. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So in this verse, Paul begins to outline the armor that God provides. We first looked at the belt of truth. Paul exhorts us to gird our waist with the belt of truth. And so this is a picture of an ancient soldier who is being prepared for action. And it's important for us to grasp this because Satan is always attacking us with lies and falsehood. Remember in 2 Timothy 2.4, Paul says, No soldier in the active service entangles himself with the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Christ has enlisted you as a soldier. And so you are to at all times and always to be prepared for this battle. So parents, have we trained our children to fight this battle? Have you trained them to put on the belt of truth? They're going to be bombarded from this culture with false ideology, false philosophies that are exalting themselves above the knowledge of God. Are they prepared to fight that battle? If they don't have the belt of truth on, they're lost before you even begin. It doesn't matter if you have the other pieces of armor on. If you don't start here, everything else falls apart. One of the commentators said it this way, It is sad that so many Christians are content to let the tunics of their daily cares and concerns flap in the breeze around them, continually interfering with their faithfulness to the Lord and giving the devil every opportunity to entangle and defeat them with their own immature habits and interests. So to gird the waist is a picture of total commitment 
to gird, to, you know, to gird your waist with the belt of truth is a picture of total commitment. It is a Christian who is committed. It is the committed Christian, just like a committed soldier or just like a committed athlete who is always prepared. An uncommitted soldier is of no use on the battlefield. In fact, the uncommitted soldier just becomes a detriment and he, he makes you, as the committed soldier, spend sideways energy dealing with him. How many times have you, as you are trying to take, deal with spiritual warfare, has spent your time spending sideways energy dealing with the uncommitted soldier? It wastes your time, and they become a detriment. So it kind of goes back to that passage. No active, no soldier in active service entangles himself, right? So the idea here is while you're trying to charge and take a particular hill, you got all these uncommitted people you're dragging with you. The uncommitted Christian who is not committed to the truth, the uncommitted Christian who is not committed to the lordship of Jesus Christ is a detriment on the battlefield. So if we're going to be successful on the battlefield, then we must have an ultimate commitment to Christ, which means we must have an ultimate commitment to his truth. And so the Bible teaches us that we are to face or that we will face enemies that are going to attack us from an inside position and those that are going to attack us from the outside position. And if you recall, when we looked at Jude, Jude was writing a letter because they were being attacked from the inside, right? Jude teaches us that those who attack us from an inside position, they sneak in when? When we let our guard down. Right? These men crept in unawares. They snuck in when you weren't paying attention. But this is why we must always have the belt of truth on. Jude says since we have enemies that sneak in, we have to contend earnestly for the faith that has been handed once for all won't hand it down once for all to us. And that idea of contending has this idea. You are to fight with an all-out determination to win. And so, as an assembly, we need to be very clear. We need to make sure that we're very on the same page here. We don't just take lightly those who would bring false doctrines and false practices in here. We don't have sympathies with those. Now, that doesn't mean we you know, are rude, but we are going to always contend earnestly for the faith, and those who promote false doctrine, false practices, should know it. They should understand they're going to have a fight on their hands if they try to bring these false things into the church. Also, we've been exhorted not to just be lights in here, but we're to be lights in the dark world. One of the commentators reminds me of this. I love this statement. He says, to be content with mediocrity, Lethargy, indifference, and half-heartedness is to fail to be armored with the belt of God's truth and leave oneself exposed to Satan's schemes. Now, last time we were here when we talked about the belt of truth, we emphasized that we must have boldness, we must have courage when we put this belt on. I go back over to Hebrews 4. I want to hit this one more time with you. I want to make sure you understand this one. If you put the belt on but you don't have courage and boldness, it doesn't do you much good, does it? Ephesians, I mean, I'm sorry, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly, notice that language, where? To the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and to help in time of need. Now, this is a great verse, and we need to you know, remind ourselves often that we need to walk in the power that God provides us, right? If we try to walk in our own strength, I think we all, from our own experience, understand how we fail, and we fail miserably. But there's something subtle here. In the Old Testament, remember, the high priest could only enter into the Holy of Holies. Not just anybody could go in there. Only the high priest at the appointed time of year. And these high priests would wear bells so that the Levites outside could hear them walking around. They would also tie a rope to these high priests um, in the event that they were struck down by God because they approached him in some kind of unworthy manner. Now, with that in mind, the author of Hebrews teaches us here, boldly approach the throne of grace. In other words, your great high priest has led the way for you and me to follow after him. And so the writer of Hebrews says, we can boldly enter into the throne of grace. We can boldly enter into the Holy of Holies based upon our union with Christ, based upon our union with our high priest. And the idea here is that can we boldly enter into the presence of the triune God but yet be afraid of what man can do? That's a real problem, isn't it? I mean, when you read about the martyrs of ages past, I mean, you know, we studied about these men who were burned at the stake last night. Where did they get such courage? How are they so bold? Well, this is the answer. Bold men have been in the presence of God. Now, with that thought fashioned in your mind, you know, to have access to the great God of the universe, the holy, the triune God of the universe, to have that access with Him. And here's the thing. If you've never been there, I could understand why you're fearful of men. I could get that. 
But with that in your mind, as we enter into the Holy of Holies, as we enter into his presence, and we now have this responsibility to proclaim the truth, are we going to keep men, we're going to let a fear of man paralyze us to inactivity. We're going to let the fear of man paralyze us to where we do not proclaim the truth. And the Christian soldier throughout the ages have historically all said no. The Christian soldier says, I do not fear the one who can kill my body, but I do fear the one who can kill my body and soul. So here's the thing. Before we leave this particular piece of armor, because we're going to move into the breastplate of righteousness this morning, we cannot in one breath say we have the belt of truth on and then lie and deceive with the next breath. You cannot have the belt of truth on and be a deceiver and a liar. And, and young people, you need to get this. Children, you need to grasp this. If you have started down a pathway of deception, understand it is hard to get off that path. And so when you are guilty of speaking lies, if you're guilty of speaking deceptions, then you are speaking with the tongue of our enemy, the enemy of our Savior, and the enemy of our souls. If Satan can get you comfortable with lying and deception, he not only has you, he will become a tool of his. Never forget what Proverbs 6 says. God says he hates the liar. And what I found in my own experience dealing with liars in the past, those who like to deceive and lie, um, and you've probably experienced this too when you've dealt with a liar. They always get mad when you call them out on their lies. They always make it look like it's your fault somehow for calling them out on their lies. And when it comes to children, you'd be amazed at the number of parents that I've, I've, I've had to deal with over the years who would defend lying children. And sure, we always hear about the people who say, you know, that person, he speaks the truth. He's always so rough and so, so direct, so blunt, as though that's negative. And they'll be quick to defend the liar, the one that God says he hates. But we need to understand this. If we have sympathies and try to defend liars, we need to understand that Satan is actively working within that individual. He has his hooks in that individual. And this is, a, this is an activity, lying deception. It's an activity that God hates. And so I, I don't want to leave this section with us wondering, well, I wonder if a person can have the belt of truth on it at the same time spew forth lies and deception. The answer is no. The answer is no. Yeah, but you don't know their heart. I know they're lying. I know that they're deceiving. And you can't have the belt of truth on and be a liar and deceiver at the same time. The liar is not doing spiritual warfare on behalf of the king of kings. Rather, he's representing the father of lies. And that's where the battle has to take place. There's enmity between the seed of the woman, which is Christ and his, the people he represents, and Satan and his seed. All right. Let's talk about the next piece of, of armament. Turn back over to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Turn, um, notice the next piece that he tells us to put on. Not only if we're going to stand, do we have to have on the, um, the belt of truth, but we have to have on what Paul says, the breastplate of righteousness. No soldier in the ancient days would ever go to battle without this breastplate on. This is a piece of armor that covered the soldier's full torso. Uh, the purpose of the armor is to protect all the vital organs, such as the heart, the lungs, the liver, uh, the Jews thought the heart represented the mind and will where the bowels were considered the seat of the emotions and feelings. And so I want you to understand this because Satan fiercely attacks the mind and the emotions. And we've got to grasp this. We need to understand ourselves. If you're driven by your emotions, then understand this is where you're going to be attacked. If you make decisions, whether you're an angry person, whether you're a person that worries and frets and wrings their hands, whatever it is, if you're driven by your emotions, that's where you'll be attacked. If you're easily provoked to anger, this is where Satan will attack you. If you're given over to worry and anxiety, that's where Satan will attack you in order to cause you to doubt God and to doubt his promises. I want you to pay attention to this because Satan doesn't need you to deny God. All he needs you to do is doubt, right? Think about the dialogue between Satan and Eve. Did Satan come in there and try to get Eve to deny the existence of God? No. All he tried to do was get her to doubt the veracity of God's word, and that's all it took to cast all of creation into a state of misery and issue in the curse. Satan uses our culture. Satan will use entertainment to tempt us to think wrong thoughts or focus on our emotions rather than have faith in God's word. Satan will also use 
Well, I think he wants to cloud our judgments with false doctrine, false philosophies that are at odds with the truth of Christ. And remember, at the heart of this warfare, we are to use the spiritual weapons that God gives us to pull down every stronghold that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. He uses false information to confuse us. He loves to snatch the word of God from our minds and replace God's glorious thoughts with perverse thoughts, lies, and deceptions. He loves to undermine holy, righteous living with immorality, with greed, envy, hate, and every other vice. He wants us to laugh at sin rather than to mourn over sin. He would have us to rationalize sin rather than to confess sin. And I think one of the greatest tactics he uses is to seduce us to become so used to sin in us and around us that it really no longer bothers our conscience. Well, does that sound overwhelming to you? I want you to understand God has given us armor to protect us from all of Satan's attacks. And the protection against those attacks that, that Satan's going to bring, one of the pieces of, of armor that he gives us is this breastplate of righteousness. This piece of armor is to be taken and wrapped around our whole being. And let's be clear. Let's make sure we understand what Paul's saying here. Number one, he's not saying put on self-righteousness. Okay? We need to remember that self-righteousness is not righteousness at all. It's one of the worst forms of sin. One of the commentators noted it this way. It is, however, with this sort of righteousness that many Christians clothe themselves, thinking that their own character and legalistic behavior and accomplishments please God and will bring his reward. But far from protecting a believer, a cloak of self-righteousness gives Satan a ready-made weapon to stifle and smother our spiritual life and service. And so uh, self-righteousness will keep the believer out of fellowship with God. I mean, you think about the Pharisees. From an outward appearance standpoint, they seem to be pr doing pretty good but their hearts were far away from God. And so fellowship with God was not possible because they clothed themselves with this veneer of self-righteousness. Turn over to Matthew 5. Remember here in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. And in this, ser this sermon, a lot of what he's doing here, he's teaching us how to live in light of kingdom principles. But what he's doing is he's trying to get these people who have been misled uh, by uh, the Pharisees, he's trying to get them to understand the nature of the kingdom, and what they were doing were at odds or opposed to the kingdom of God. But notice what he says in verse 24. I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, to, to the Jews that heard that this that, on that day, uh, there was no one more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. So what is he saying? Unless your righteousness exceeds the self-righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. We all understand what the Bible says. Our righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags. It does not bring us favor with God. And it certainly cannot protect us from Satan. In fact, self-righteousness is one of the tools that Satan uses to grab us. I also don't think Paul is talking about the righteousness of Christ in this context either. When he says to put on the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ is what was imputed, the perfect righteousness of God was imputed to the believer the moment they put their trust in Christ. Let me just show you one text, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 21. For he made him, talking about Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Think about it this way. We cannot put on what God has already clothed us with. You know, the Bible paints this picture, you know, over and over again, both in the Old and New Testament, that what Christ were clothed in his perfect righteousness. You know, you think about Zechariah 3 when the uh, uh, Satan comes before to, you know, make a, an accusation against Joshua the high priest. And what does God say? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Don't you call clean, unclean what I call clean. And remember, he talks about how he took the filthy rags of the high priest off and clothed him with the garments of God. The righteousness of Christ protects us from hell, gains us entry into the new heavens and new earth. But um, this is not the armor that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians 6, though. Because we need something that will protect us from the schemes of Satan. The breastplate of righteousness that we put on as armor, an armor of protection from our adversary, uh, this is what some would you know, make a distinction between the imputed righteousness of Christ and practical righteousness. Um, the Puritans write about this. The Puritans make a distinction between the imputed righteousness of Christ and the imparted righteousness of God. 
But this practical righteousness that Paul is telling us to put on as redeemed believers, as those who have been imputed, have the imputed righteousness of Christ, we are to put on what Paul is going to refer to as the breastplate of righteousness, or what we, for our, our time this morning, will call practical righteousness that is lived in obedience to God's word by God's enabling power, by God's grace. And we've talked about this in the past, but it's this idea of putting off the vices and putting on the virtues of Christ that are in alignment with the new man that was created in Christ. Turn over to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, look at verse 24. He says, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Because of that, Paul says, therefore putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So this is how we don't give place to Satan. We don't lie. You know, we are a new creature. Excuse me, a new creation in Christ, and we're constantly taking off these vices that he talks about. You can continue to read this section. We take off the vices and we put on the virtues. Uh, turn over to Colossians 3, which is a parallel account. Colossians 3, look at verse 9. Paul says, once again, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Whether it's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. He goes on in verse 12. Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on the tender mercies. Notice we're to put this on, take off the vices, but we're to put on kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body to be th and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, notice how the practical righteousness is dependent upon the imputed righteousness of Christ. The imputed righteousness of Christ leads to practical righteousness. Uh, they're distinct, but they go together. Turn over to Philippians 3. Philippians 3, look at verse 9. Well, go back to verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these have counted loss for Christ. Remember, Paul has just outlined his rich heritage as a Jew, of the Jew of Jews, as a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? If anybody could have uh, uh, merited salvation through their good works, Paul says, certainly it was I. But notice what he says here in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted for loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of, of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, and if by means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then he says in verse 12, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Jesus Christ. And notice here, Paul shows the relationship between the imputed righteousness of Christ, this righteousness that comes from God, he talks about, and practical righteousness. His salvation, he tells us, was solely upon God's imputed righteousness. Paul wants us to understand that this righteousness that he possessed was not his but something that was given to him by God. But his Christian living was an outworking of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Imputed righteousness makes practical righteousness possible. Obedience, which is the manifestation of our, Lord, of our love towards Christ. Obedience to God's word makes practical righteousness a reality. Paul gloried in the imputed righteousness of Christ, which can only happen by God's grace. And he did not presume upon God's grace like so many have done throughout history and so many have done even in our day. 
I mean, you've met these kinds of Christians. They have this attitude. You know, it doesn't really matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't really matter what I do since I've been saved by Christ. I, I hope you see that's a very, very flawed theology. It's a flawed theology that opens the individual up to be attacked by Satan. And unfortunately, they're used by Satan within the church and within their families when they think this way. And we met these kind of people. You know these kind of people. Uh, they are there, you know, they, they surround us, especially here in the South. The question we have to ask ourselves is whether we grant them access and influence within our lives and within the lives of our family. Understand this false doctrine of easy believism, this antinomian spirit that, that inv has invaded the church today, is in direct opposition to the clear teachings of the scriptures. Let me just give you one. Go back over to Romans 6. Romans 6. We've looked at this before, but just note it again. Paul says in Romans 6, 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that many of us were baptized into Christ? Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in his likeness of his death, certainly we should also be in the likeness of his <coughs> resurrection. And notice this, Jesus died to save us from every aspect of sin, its presence and its power. When we ignore this clear teaching here, we open ourselves up to all kinds of attacks from Satan. And this is why Paul exhorts us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. This means we are to live in a daily, moment-by-moment -moment obedience to our Heavenly Father. And so this part of the armor points us to holy living. God provides the standard for holiness. Remember he says, be holy, for I am holy. <coughs> God provides the standard for holiness, and he supplies the power to walk in holiness. God clothes us with his righteousness. And experientially, experientially, we remove the rags of the old man and place on the new clothes of the new man. I know that's kind of hard to hear because a lot of times in reform circles we, we like to just really focus on justification by faith alone and Christ alone, right? But you do realize that the Bible teaches us we are created as Christians for good works, right? Turn, turn to Re uh, Revelation 19. Let me just show you something here. Revelation 19.6 tells us this, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, notice, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linens, clean and bright, for the fine linens were the righteous acts of the saints. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's the ground and foundation of these righteous acts. These righteous acts are done in faith by the grace of God to the glory of God. When we do good things but it's not to the glory of God, we know those things out. The atheistic philanthropist can do good things. He doesn't do it for the glory of God. He's not going to be clothed in these types of fine linens. But God grants this to us. Notice these good works are granted to us by God. So we shouldn't have a problem as Reformed Christians talking about the works, the good works of Christians. We are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's practical living, holy living before a holy and triune God. Now let's talk about the consequences of not putting on this breastplate. I just want to hit a couple of hot spots here. What happens if we don't put on the breastplate of righteousness? Number one, there's a loss. Of, you're going to experience a loss of joy. We open ourselves to attack when we refuse to put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's certainly obvious. But not to be armored with the breastplate of righteousness will cost us our joy. Turn over to 1 John. 1 John. First John 1. Notice in verse 4 what, what John says. And these things we write to you. Why, why do you write this letter, John? That your joy may be full. This letter contains, if you read through this letter, it contains many warnings. It contains many commands to believers. 
and other truths that are given to us. Why? So that our joy may be complete. In other words, disobedience does not bring in joy. In, other, in the words of one, the only joyful Christian is the obedient Christian. And if you think about it, most of the emotional, most of the relational problems we experience are caused by lack of personal holiness. One rightly pointed out, many of our disappointments and discouragements do not come from circumstances or from other people, but from our own unconfessed and unclean sin. And he goes on to point out, and when circumstances and other people do manage to rob us of happiness, it is because we are unprotected by the armor of a holy life. So the point he's making is that much of our unhappiness, most of the, the time we lack joy, it's just due to our own sin. You remember David? Turn to Psalm 51. Can you think of a saint in the Old Testament that uh, forgot to put his breastplate of righteousness on? David's a great example of that, isn't he? Psalm 51. When David committed his sin with Bathsheba and her husband Uriah, I want you I want to read through this and notice how he, he, call, he points out he had no peace. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin and my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that my bones you have broken may rejoice. I want you to pay attention here. You can continue to read this on your own. But notice here in the psalm, there's a lack of peace that David was experiencing here. He's crying out here, particularly, go, go to verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Notice here, he's crying out in verse 12 that God would restore something, restore his joy. Sin, the refusal to put on the breastplate of righteousness, will rob you of your joy. And our joy cannot be replaced by you know, paper armor that many churches supply their members today, right? The armor of good advice or programs or activities or techniques or methods that cannot you know, provide only what the armor of God can provide. What many in the church need to do is put on the armor of holy living to restore their joy. No program, no method or technique can bring the wholeness. Holiness cannot, cannot bring joy to a person who is unwilling to confront and forsake their sin. So, if you're here today and you lack joy, then you've got to step back and ask yourself whether or not you have the armor of holy living on or if you have forsaken your armor and you've been forgetting to put it on. You need to go back and meditate upon this psalm. Let David teach you how to restore your joy. This is a man who sinned and sinned greatly. But he's teaching you here in this psalm about how to restore your joy. What happens if we don't put on our uh, breastplate of righteousness, the loss of joy? There's, there's fruitlessness in your life. Failure to be armed with practical righteousness will cause you to be a fruitless Christian. The disobedient Christian is unproductive in the things of the Lord. Whatever accomplishments you may think you are achieving, it's just going to be a shell without any spiritual fruit inside. So if you think about your life, do you lack fruit? If so, come back to this principle. Begin to examine yourself to see if you've been neglecting to put this armor on. There's a loss of reward. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 3. So there's a loss of joy. There's fruitlessness in the person who forgets to put on their armor, the breastplate of righteousness. But there's also a loss of reward. Notice in 1 Corinthians 3. Pick up the reading in verse 12. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet it's through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple, are, which temple you are? But notice here, Unholy living brings a loss of reward. Whatever the world, whatever is worldly, whatever is fleshly, um, it's not going. Whatever you're doing there, that's worldly or fleshly, is not going to amount to anything. It's not going to be a, 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 amount to anything worthy of heavenly praise. It's, it's no more than 
wood, hay, straw in the sight of God. And so when we stand before God, those worthless works will be consumed. There's also a reproach on God's glory. When we refuse to put on the breastplate of righteousness, we are a reproach on God's glory. Unholy living brings a reproach on His glory. The greatest evil of a Christian's sin is its reflection on God's glory. Turn over to Titus 2. Titus 2. Titus 2, look at verse 10. Notice he says, Not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. When we sin, what we're not doing is we're not adorning ourselves with the doctrine of God. You know, in other words, when we sin as Christians, what we're doing is we're not adorning ourselves with doctrines. In other words, what we say we believe. Think about it this way. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. So fleshly lust and every other form of sin are part of you know, Satan's arsenal, which he wages war against our soul. So our armor must include the breastplate of righteousness. The righteousness, this righteousness must include every area of our life, which would include all of our thoughts as well. So we've got to gain control over that. Notice, turn over to Colossians 3. Notice how Paul states it over in Colossians. Colossians 3. Look at verse 2. Set your minds on the things above, not on the earth, for there you died, and there is hidden uh, with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, and you will also appear with him in glory. And so the idea here is we're to set our mind on things above. We can't be steeped in pagan darkness. We're to put on the armor of light. So when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, this breastplate of righteousness, it, it has to be... We need to think thoughts after God. We need to have God's Word transform the way we think, which is going to impact the way we behave. But we must have this breastplate of righteousness on. So turn back over to Ephesians 6. How do we as Christians, Christian soldiers, how do we stand? You put the belt of truth on, and you put the breastplate of righteousness on. There is no other way for the Christian to stand and hold firm ground within this battle. All right. So that was kind of an introduction to this topic of the breastplate of righteousness. I want to start drilling down on this some. I want to, the first thing I want to do is really start looking at the connection. Is, what's the connection between the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness? I hope you begin to understand that they go together. In other words, you can't have one without the other. In other words, you can't run around lying and deceiving at the same time claim you've got the breastplate of righteousness on, right? Truth and holiness go together. One of the Puritans studied it this way to drive the point home. He says, an orthodox judgment coming from an unholy heart and an ungodly life is as ugly as a man's head would be on a beast's shoulders. They just don't go together. There's something not natural to say I have the belt of truth on but not the breastplate of righteousness. Or to say I have the breastplate of righteousness on but not the belt of truth. The idea here is that the person who knows the truth but practices evil is worse than the man who is ignorant. Understand this. Both are slaves of Satan. But it is horrible for one who knows the truth and then turn from that truth so that they might practice sin. The same Puritan goes on to say, If you are a slave to the devil, it does not matter whether, your chains, whether the chains fasten you to him by the head or by the foot. He holds you just as surely by the foot in your actions as he would by the head in your blasphemy. But we need to understand that for the Christian, our wickedness is greater because it is committed in the fact of truth. Another writer says it this way, sinners miss their way to heaven in the dark or are misled by erroneous judgment, which, if corrected, might bring them back to the path of holiness. Now, that's the case for the unbelieving sinner. But you, talking about the Christian, sin in the broad daylight of truth and boldly head for hell at high noon. Now, that, that should be a sobering thought for each and every one of us in here today who claims to be a Christian but is content at playing in their sin. And so if you think about it, the professing Christian, the one who claims to know the truth but loves his sin, is no better than Satan. They say, well, now that's, hang on, that's a, bit, that's a bit strong. We don't like to talk like that here in the South. But think about it this way. Satan knows truth from error, right? He just doesn't want to be ruled by it. And the same is true for the Christian who knows the truth but practices sin. He refuses to be ruled by that truth. And we, we should never forget in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is on earth as it is in heaven. The true Christian, unlike Satan, wants the rule and reign of Christ to invade this earth. 
The true Christian demonstrates his desire by bringing himself under Christ's dominion and living a life that pleases his master. Truth and holiness have to be linked together. We only pretend to be sincere if we're not living holy lives, righteous lives. In other words, God never recognizes unholy sincerity. Well, it doesn't matter what they do as long as they were sincere. I can't find that in the scriptures. I mean, when you talk about unholy sincerity, those terms clash within your mind when I speak of it like it does in my, my, my head. Never forget this. True sincerity teaches the soul to point to the only you know, worthy end with respect to your actions. The only worthy end with respect to our actions is that God the Father gets glorified. Another way to look at this, holiness and righteousness in the truth is the sincere man's path. If you claim I am a sincere Christian, then you do not have a problem with me talking about truth and righteousness, truth and holiness having to be linked together. And if you're here and you're prone to shortcuts, then you're just fooling yourself that you're sincere. One stated it this way, if he finds a new way of glorifying God which God has not charted, then he must find a new heaven which God has not prepared. The writer goes on to say this, hell is full of good intentions. Plenty of people are there who meant well on earth, but their lives fail to demonstrate their basic honesty. Who would believe the man's argument that his well was full of sweet water, pure water, when all he had was a bucket of sour, muddy water? You say you have an upright heart and moral thoughts when everything coming out of your life is evil. Surely you do not believe that yourself. So we need to make sure we are examining ourselves, examining our lives to make sure we're not guilty of refusing to link truth and holiness together. Why every Christian should keep his breastplate on. We looked earlier at what happens when we don't wear it. But I want to rephrase the question. Why every Christian should keep the breastplate on? Well, you should keep the breastplate on because God wants his children to be holy. And so this should make every Christian. If you say you're here to see the desires of God to take place within your life, well, this is one of his desires. This is his will. Think about a soldier who's not willing to follow their general's will. He's just not a fit soldier. All of our ambitions have to be brought under God's desire. Can you, like Christ, pray, not my will, but your will be done? And so if we want to be Christ, then we must want to see God's will done within our lives, even if it costs us everything. Remember, when Christ prayed this in Luke twenty-two forty-two, where was he headed? He's headed to the cross. But let's flesh this out. Does the Bible teach us that God wants us to be holy? Yes. Turn to Ephesians 1. We see this in his eternal decrees. Turn to Ephesians 1. In God's eternal decrees, he makes it very clear here in Ephesians that he wants us to be holy. In Ephesians 1, look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? holy and without blame before him in love. Notice, in God's infinite wisdom, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy. God has resolved to make us a holy people. Turn to Romans 8. <coughs> Romans 8. Romans 8, look at the verse 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Notice here, God is predestined that his children would be conformed to the image of his own dear Son. Look over at Romans 9. Pick up the reading in verse 15. Well, go to verse 14. So earlier on he was talking about the doctrine of election. You know, in... in he, he asked this question. He, he, it's, it's obvious he's had this discussion before. And when he's taught on this doctrine, one of the typical responses is, well, that seems to make God, is that fair, right? Is God unjust? So he, he, he anticipates this reaction to his teaching in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. 
For it says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says of the Pharaoh, or says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. And you will say to me, Why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power of the clay? Notice this, from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and one for dishonor. But the point here is that when we see what God does for his elect, for his people that he has saved, God takes some vessels and he makes them vessels of honor, trophies of his grace. And so when God saves us, he purposes to make us holy. Turn over to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Look at uh, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in, in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So notice, God has chosen some out of all mankind to set them apart, to carve them, carve them out, to make them... Uh, reflect the image of his righteousness and holiness. We are his workmanship. And this workmanship is such of high quality that when it's finished, we will be presented before his presence without blame or without fault. So here's the question. Do you sense this work of grace happening in your life? Do you sense God working to make you look more and more like Christ? He's making you holy. Do you sense his working within your life? I didn't ask you, is he completed? I'm asking you, since you have professed his name, since you have called out to him to save you, have you seen his spirit work within you, pruning those things off? Do you see that the fruit of the spirit is working within your life? Well, we should want to put on the breastplate of righteousness because in God's holy decrees, he has declared he will make us righteous. We also know that he wants us to be holy because he sent his son into the world. God demonstrates that he desires us to be holy. It's, it's seen in the fact that he sent his son. Now think about this. He sent his son. If you read through the scriptures over and over again, we see God sending his angels, his messengers, to do his bidding. He sends them to do all kinds of important assignments. But God has such an important assignment to be done that he would not trust this to any of his angelic servants, but to only his son. Turn back over to Titus. Let me point something out there to you. Titus 2, look at verse 14. Notice talking about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now Christ gave himself to redeem us from all iniquity, to, you know, to purify us, to, to make us ready to do good works. Remember, the second Adam came to recover what the first Adam lost. And God is glorified in this great accomplishment. Just as God is glorious in, in, in the holiness of his own nature and work, so he is glorified by the holiness of his own people. But God is not glorified when we defy him in carnality and sin. A Christian is not one who lives in some kind of unrestrained freedom before God. That kind of life dishonors God. Our joy is tied to reflecting, um, to be an image bearers of God. And as we reflect his glorious nature, as he's working in us, as we work out what he is working in us, we glorify him and it brings us great joy. It should be our pleasure. Turn, turn over to Philippians 3 again. Philippians 3. Pick up the reading there again. Just look at verse 17 again. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk as you have for a pattern, have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is the destruction, whose God is their belly, whose, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Now, notice here. I wonder how many people would be so bold as to challenge Paul by saying, well, you really don't know their hearts. Who are you to say that about? But I hope you can see, Paul makes it clear here, there are those who walk in such a way that they are enemies in Christ 
enemies of Christ by the way they walk and conduct themselves. And those individuals, they have no joy. Christ came to destroy the work of Satan, but the careless walker goes about trying to undo the work of Christ. Christ shed his own blood to redeem souls out from the, under the power of sin and Satan, but the carnal Christian, the loose Christian, if you can even call that Christian, denies the Lord that bought them and they are gravitating to their, their bondage which Christ says he came and redeemed us from. Well, this is why it's problematic for a Christian to talk uh, about being redeemed and ransomed at the same time living habitually in sin with no desire to serve the King of Kings. So we know that God desires holiness because he has decreed it before the foundation of the world. We know that he desires holiness because he sent his son to redeem us from lawless deeds. And we also know that God, turn over to Ezekiel 36, we know that God wants us to be holy because of the regenerating work of the Spirit. Since it's God's will to make his people righteous, he gives us a new heart. This is a great promise in the Old Testament. Notice there in Ezekiel 36, and look at verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And the idea of a heart of stone is a, is a heart that's unresponsive to the things of God. The heart of flesh is a flesh that responds to the will of God. God has a higher quality of life for us to live. One of the Puritans put it this way, an old heart would serve well enough to accomplish the devil's drudgery. But because God has a higher place for his people, his might... Uh, for his people, his spirit lifts their head out of sin's dungeon and brings them into the personal course of service, into his personal course of service. This is what God does when he regenerates us, brings us from spiritual death into spiritual life. What God does in regeneration is he takes off the old jail clothes and he gives us these beautiful garments. He beautifies the Christian with the grace of his spirit. I mean, I hope you picked up on that in 1 Corinthians 3 where Paul reminds them, you are the dwelling place of the spirit. Think about the care and the attention God gave to the temple there in Israel. Costly materials were used to construct it since he declared the temple to be holy. When we talk about the temple to be holy, it means it was set aside, it was consecrated for his use. But that structure does not even come close to the glory of a regenerated soul. Remember, we're now the temple of God. This is the place where God dwells. In regeneration, God consecrates us. He sets us aside for his use. He makes us holy. And so in Ephesians, Paul says we are the workmanship of God and created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Once again, this is what makes our sin even more serious than the sin of the unbeliever because we're sinning against this mighty work of God that has taken place within our lives. Remember, a sin in the temple was more grave than a sin committed in one's home because the temple was a consecrated place. And so one put it this way. The sin of a natural man is theft because he robs God of the glory due to him. But the sin of a saint is sacrilege because he robs God of the sacredness which his profession of faith has vowed to him. And so as new creations, we have responsibilities over and over and over again. As we look there in Ephesians, as we look there in the Colossians, as we saw there in Philippians, because of our relationship to Christ, we have a responsibility to walk in a way um, that is worthy of our calling. Think about Paul in, in, in the letter to the Corinthians. Why was he so upset with them? They were living below their calling. They were living like men of the world. They were sinning against the light of God that God had given to them. And as Christians, we sin against the life of God that is within us when we sin. So we should never forget that God's desire for us is to be holy and that's seen in the regenerating work of the Spirit. One more. We know that God desires us to be holy, to walk in righteousness because of his word and the ordinances. The word of God is the seed that provides holiness. It is also the thing that nourishes holiness within our lives. God's word provides the perfect, perfect rule of holiness. He gives us the standard by which we're to walk, and his standard is not changeable. Also, he gives us promises that he will present us blameless and without spot or without blemish. He gives us threatenings in the scriptures to warn us of the consequences of unholy behavior. The word that he gives us, he gives us examples within his word of, of people who walked on the pathways of righteousness. He gives us examples, unholy examples, to show us their destiny when, when people who knew better but didn't take seriously the commands of God. I mean, just one more. 
1 Corinthians 10. And we'll, we'll try to bring this to a close because we have a lot to talk about here about the breastplate of righteousness. But in 1 Corinthians 10, I just want you to see this. You know, in verse 6, it says, Now these things became our examples. And he just gave these Old Testament examples like in verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Talking about all those people who rebelled there in the wilderness. And I want you to think about those people. That, that was a very privileged people. They had seen the Red Sea part. They had experienced God's plagues upon the most powerful nation in the world at that time. <coughs> they saw the greatest army in the world at that time destroyed in the Red Sea. They saw water coming out of a rock. They saw the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. They saw God provide them food every day. Uh, in Deuteronomy, it talks you know, to the second generation, it tells them, you had shoes that didn't wear out for 40 years. I fed you. I gave you water. I took care of you all those years. But notice what Paul reminds us. Most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Why do we have that written record of those people? He tells you, these were written. These things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Well, we need to heed the warnings and look to the examples God has given to us within the Bible. But within these historical narratives of the Old Testament, we see the kind of God life that God blesses as opposed to the kind of life that God curses. We see from the written testimony of God's word that he desires for us to be holy. And he has given us those examples of men who were faithful. We read about it in Hebrews 11. Faithful men and the reward that they received. And we read about all those unfaithful people who spurned his love, who thumbed their nose at it. And we see their destiny. Well, let's stop here this, after, this morning. We've seen that it is God's will that we are holy. He has given us the imputed righteousness of Christ. He will impart holiness to us through the work of the Spirit who dwells within us. And don't forget the truth. Don't forget this fact that truth and holiness go together. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness go together. Don't try to wear one without the other. And Lord willing, I'm going to come back. We're going to explore the breastplate of righteousness a little bit further because we look at, you know, this is God's will for us. This is God's will that we wear this piece of armor. So if it's God's will that we wear this armor, then guess what Satan's will is? He's going to use everything at his disposal to keep you from putting the breastplate of righteousness on. You need to be uh, wise about his schemes in this area. Satan wants us to be unrighteous. So we're going to look at his schemes that he uses to keep us from wearing the breastplate of righteousness. So we need to pray for God's grace that we would take these warnings seriously. We would put the armor on so that we might be able to stand as Paul has called us to stand. Father, we thank you once again that you have not left us blind, stupid, without any any instructions. Father, you've given us your word. And your word is teaching us that we need to put this breastplate of righteousness on. We need to live a life that demonstrates your power within us. Father, may we not take this teaching and try to weave together uh, armor of self-righteousness because we know that will fail. But Father, we pray that the imputed righteousness of Christ has been granted to all those who have been professed Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. We pray for those here who have not made a profession of faith yet. We pray that your spirit would work within them. Let them see their need for, for Christ. May they see that they are sinners and that uh, you are a holy and just God. But you are a good God. You are a merciful God. You are a gracious God who has sent his Son so that we might live with you for eternity. And so, Father, we pray that through the imputed righteousness of Christ, based upon that foundation, we would begin to manifest fruit within our lives that give you glory. Father, help us to put on this breastplate. Help us to be able to stand. May we not be given in over to compromise. May we not be given over to retreat and flee from the battlefield. But may we proclaim the goodness of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.